So good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Life Post-COVID-19, What Does the New Normal Look Like? This webinar is a collaboration between Chapters Indonesia, Swiss Chem Indonesia, and North Chem. My name is uh, Pinkan Mokalu. I am the Executive Director of Swiss Indonesian Chamber of Commerce, or Swiss Chem for short, and I am excited to be opening this webinar today. Thank you all of you who are attending this webinar, and a very special thank you to today's speaker, Professor Amin Subandrio, Professor Hasbullah Tabrani, Professor Tiki Pangestu, and also to Dr. Lutfi Mardiansah, Chairman and Founder of Chapters Indonesia, who will be our moderator for today. Before I hand over the microphone to Dr. Lutfi, uh, there are a few housekeeping items that I would like to go through. First, today's presentation material will be available on demand after the live session, and a recording of the session will be available at our website. Next, during the webinar, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions for our speakers anytime during presentations, we have opened our Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of the screen. So please feel free to send through your question anytime. However, when typing in your question, please start with your name and institution before your question, so know who we are addressing. We will be addressing your question at the end of presentation, and we apologize in advance if we could not go through all the questions uh, due to the timing. And last, after our session, we'll be sending out a short survey link through email to find out about your experience today. Therefore, please spend a few minutes of your time to fill them out. So without any further ado, I would like to kick off the meeting by welcoming our moderator, Dr. Lutfi Mardiansah. Pak Lutfi, over to you. Thank you, Bu Bingkan. Also, thank you to the Swiss Chairman, North Chen, for having this collaboration to conduct our webinar series. And uh, so, thank you to all the speakers, Prof. Amin Bandrio, <coughs> Prof. Hasbullah Tabrani, and also Prof. Tiki Pangestu, from, uh, from all the experts that uh, we are going to have all the, the, the experience, also some knowledge on how we are see this pandemic that happened in our country and also all, all over the world. And um, as you know that uh, we are not going to far from this uh, pandemic even uh, in short term, as uh, even though the PSBB will be lifted up in some other uh, province or cities, but it, I don't think that we are going to uh, be free from this uh, situation. But, uh, and then uh, recently we have been listening or hearing from many different uh, stakeholders uh, the, what we call the new normal terminology. So then uh, are we ready uh, on this new normal or are we, well, what we need to do or we need to prepare for this uh, kind of uh, new normal life in the, in, the, in the near future. So for that uh, we are going to listen from the we expert, Prof. Uh, Amin, from the scientific perspective, from Prof. Uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the health economic perspective, and we also hope that from uh, Prof. Tiki Bang is to uh, explain or sharing with us on what uh, should be doing by all of the community listening and uh, learning from other countries. So without you, I uh, would like to invite uh, Prof. Amin to first and then uh, continue with Prof. Pula, then Prof. Kiki Pangestu, then later on as mentioned by Prof. Pinkan, we are going to have a question and answer session. Uh, as we are doing webinar, so the technical should be uh, handled properly, so uh, apologize if uh, I will be the bad guy to stop or to uh, ensure that we are talking on the, on the very uh, short uh, sentence. Okay, Prof. Amin. Thank you, and then floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lutfi. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to extend uh, our gratitude and appreciation to Swiss Champ uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and also giving me the opportunity to share a little bit of my uh, knowledge related to uh, COVID-19. and. Uh, how we have to deal with 
this uh, pandemic situation. So uh, please allow me to share with you uh, my slides. Okay, yeah, this is the, the general title of this webinar, uh, Life Post-COVID-19, what does the new normal look like? Yeah, of course, uh, I will talk from my perspective, but I'm sure later uh, the following speakers will uh, elaborate further. Uh, I would like to start with just uh, numbers as to, to remind uh, all of us how uh, serious this problem and how, how big is the problem. So globally, we have uh, five, more than 5 million cases. Uh, of course, this, is, uh, this data is collected uh, about two days ago. Um, there are almost 100,000 new cases and if you look, look at the death number uh, globally, uh, new cases is about uh, almost 1,500 something. And uh, we could see also the distribution of cases and deaths in uh, other region like Africa, Americas, Eastern Mediterranean, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, Western Pacific, and of course, Indonesia. Yeah, if we uh, look at these uh, numbers, um, yeah, uh, in Americas and Europe, there are, the numbers are the highest, uh, more than two uh, million cases already identified uh, so far and number of deaths, so of, of almost 150,000 in, in this uh, region. How about in Indonesia, we could see here, uh, until two days ago, we have uh, almost 23,000 uh, cases, and uh, additional case per day is uh, almost 500. Uh, if we remember a couple of days ago, uh, the number the number of new case cases uh, reached uh, more than 900, almost 1,000 per day, but it's only one day. And uh, so far, we have uh, uh, 1,400 deaths. Uh, but the uh, good news is the number of uh, recovered patients also increasing. So, uh, so far already more than 4,000, probably 5,000. Yeah, this is uh, just show the magnitude of the problem we are currently facing. How about situation in Indonesia? This is uh, the data reported uh, again uh, two days ago, 27th of May, uh, at the uh, noon time. So number of positive cases are uh, almost 24,000. And yeah, I have to correct myself. Number of uh, recovered patients is uh, already more than 6,000 uh, patients compared to those uh, uh, who come to the fatality, uh, almost 1,500. Uh, the number, this number are still increasing. If you look at the uh, uh, graph, this is uh, the number of positive cases up to two days ago, still increasing. And uh, the additional number are still, I mean, the curve is not decreasing, but uh, still the shape of the curve are still like uh, sharp teeth. Uh, up and down. Uh, but if we look at uh, one example, I mean one area in Jakarta only, <clears throat> again this, this data shows uh, uh, data reported up to two days ago. Uh, the peak 
of the number of cases which usually already uh, reached a um, couple of days ago. And the tendency now is already uh, flattening, hopefully. Hopefully it's a flattening and also will go down uh, soon. Yeah, this is in Jakarta. But if we uh, look further uh, to the data reported from its uh, provinces, the graph, the epidemic graph is uh, quite uh, very different from uh, each other. Some area we could see, for example, this is uh, South Sumatra, Sumatra Selatan. The curve is still increasing uh, sharply. Also, Sumatra Barat, West Sumatra, yeah, Papua. But in some area, we could see the uh, West, uh, sorry, the NTV, Nusa Tenggara Barat, already decreasing. Uh, uh, North Kalimantan, Kalimantan Utara, already uh, uh, decreasing. Yeah. So this, this uh, figure should be used as base when uh, uh, the that the province would like to decide whether they start the, uh, say, uh, new normal or not. Yeah. Because uh, as we will discuss later, that we have to consider a specific situation yeah, from its uh, area. We cannot use the national data to decide, uh, to make decision for uh, particular uh, provinces. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to share with you uh, the movement of coronavirus uh, that isolated in Indonesia. Yeah, I took just uh, three examples of a whole genome sequence that uh, we have already submitted to GSAID. Yeah. Uh, from this picture, we could uh, notice that before uh, arriving in, in from Wuhan, because um, those three isolate actually derive from Wuhan, but not that. Yeah. One virus was uh, flying to Europe and Middle East before entering Indonesia. The other virus was uh, visiting the U.S. first before uh, yeah. and the third virus was traveling to Australia before uh, finally landed in, in Indonesia. So we could see that uh, a virus circulating in Indonesia actually um, many of them are so-called imported case at the beginning, but then uh, it become uh, local transmission yeah, uh, between Indonesian uh, people. Yeah. So this this uh, pattern is very important when we have to uh, decide which uh, virus should be used as a model for a vaccine development. Okay, so the question is whether there will be a post-COVID-19 as I mentioned in the title of uh, the webinar. Currently, we notice that uh, uh, COVID-19 has so many symptoms. At the beginning, we consider only fever or chills, coughing, short amount of breath, but uh, later we noticed that uh, the symptom of COVID could be just muscle ache or just headache or just uh, fatigue or just a uh, new loss of taste or smell. Yeah, I have uh, some patient have no other symptom than just loss of taste and smell. Yeah. Uh, other conditions are generally okay. Or also only sore throat or runny nose, like uh, uh, just common, common uh, influenza. 
sun, having uh, vomiting, nausea, and diarrhea. So uh, you could see that the, the range of symptoms is quite uh, wide. On the other hand, we don't have specific uh, antivirus currently. So there are so many fears, remdesivir or oseltamivir and many, many fears, fears. And also we don't have yet a vaccine in our hand. So WSO predicted that probably we will have no vaccine until the end of 2021. Uh, currently, uh, already in the pipeline, uh, various kind of uh, vaccine. Uh, one is uh, based on uh, the whole vaccine, uh, live attenuated vaccine. The other one using uh, the whole vaccine but uh, inactivated. The other using uh, vector vaccine and then uh, uh, subunit vaccine, DNA vaccine, or RNA vaccine. Uh, one of the uh, most advanced vaccine is I mean, based on uh, RNA vaccine uh, introduced by a large company Moderna in the US. So we still have to wait for another 12 or 18 months to get the vaccine in uh, our hand. So based on that situation, yeah. We are now facing a disease with many phases because uh, we, cannot, we cannot consider only fever and coughing, but again, these are the, this is the list of uh, the symptoms. And uh, also, we don't have specific antivirus uh, available at the moment. So we don't have specific vaccine also. So uh, based on that situation, we have to uh, accept the situation that uh, the SARS coronavirus 2 will stay with us for longer period. We don't know uh, whether it will be three months, six months, or another two years, uh, or for many years because we uh, do have experience, sorry, uh, we do have experience with, uh, for example, this is smallpox. Uh, it took 200 years to, uh, to successfully control uh, the smallpox. Yeah? After uh, Dr. Yenner introduced of uh, smallpox vaccination in uh, 1796 and then 200 years later in 1975 uh, it was declared that the world is free from smallpox and also we have uh, another situation the uh, influenza uh, Spanish flu we had the pandemic in 1918, but we still have the influenza virus circulating with us. Okay. Now, uh, this is these are also uh, some microbes that uh, currently still living, say quote unquote, peacefully with us. Yeah, we have to live with them. Yeah, from tuberculosis, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever, HIV, influenza, hepatitis, malaria. Yeah, we we still have to. Uh, of course, we have to to uh, protect ourselves from uh, being infected uh, by these uh, microbes. But uh, we realize also that it is still difficult to get. Uh, the vaccine and so on. So we have to accept to live together with them. Now, so uh, if we would like to declare ourselves uh, to be ready uh, to enter the new normal, there are some prerequisites. Of course, uh, we have to 
uh, make sure that uh, we have everything to control the the transmission of uh, COVID-19. And uh, we have to make sure also that the uh, public health and health system capacities uh, are already in place. And the risk of outbreak is already minimized, especially in high vulnerable uh, population. And also we could make sure that uh, the work Place they have a pre preventive measure, uh, which is implemented uh, very strictly, and also uh, importation of uh, goods and everything yeah, should be managed. And also uh, we have to listen to the community uh, if there is any any uh, problem or suggestion they have. Yeah. So I. Uh, what what uh, Dr. Punam Singh, uh, the, the regional director of uh, Southeast Asia WHO office, he mentioned that countries in the region must continue to take evidence informed action and conduct careful risk assessment while winding back public health and social measures. The focus should be on local epidemiology. Again, local epidemiology, as I showed before, we should consider a specific epidemic curve from each province in Indonesia to identify hotspots and clusters and the capacity of system and responders to find, isolate, and care for cases and quarantine contacts. Those are uh, important uh, step that we, we have uh, to do before we declare ourselves ready for the new normal. Uh, I identified uh, so far uh, the characteristics of uh, new normal. Yeah, usually uh, we will find there will be uh, new standards. Uh, for example, standards of uh, uh, health servers. There will be. Uh, uh, um, telemedicine and so on, uh, especially for dental ENT specialists. And of course, uh, we are face also a change in working condition. Yeah. So everything that should be uh, uh, changed should be modified to uh, anticipate everything. And then uh, we have to uh, Take procedure for quick detection and isolating the uh, isolating infected people, and also restricted travel and social distancing. So with with uh, that that uh, activities in the future will have the so-called uh, LPCSE, the less physical contact society or economy. Hopefully, uh, in the future, we could we could do our business. We could be productive, but still safe from the uh, threat of pandemic. I think uh, that's I would like to share with you. Uh, yeah, we realize that we may not in, but currently we are in the same storm. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Pak. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you, Prof. Amin. I think what we learned from uh, Prof. Amin's presentation that uh, we are going to live with the virus, including the COVID virus, for longer time than what we expect or maybe we predicted before. Because, uh, Prof. Amin, there is some uh, study that we are uh, uh, predicted that by June or by July, we are going to have a uh, Better situation. That's why that's what uh, we are discussing on the uh, new normal. But uh, listen to what uh, you can uh, explain to us. The situation in current condition in Indonesia will not be what we expect. Uh, please hold not to answer this question yet until we finish the discussion. Um, I would like to invite Prof. Haskula Tabrani to uh, provide us also some uh, his presentation or his thought on the on the. Uh, current situation and also probably his opinion on what would be the 
new normal. The professional stop. Uh, thank you, Pak. Very much, Pak Lutfi, uh, Pak Tiki, and Pak Amin, and Bu Pinkan, and everyone uh, participants. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to give me to share this view. Um, I put the title pandemic and also infodemic because there are also information spread out uh, both uh, right information and hoax information and creating more chaotic and also information from people who are opposing current policy, uh, whatever the policy they oppose and they criticizing. So that the situation that we are facing now, um, I don't know whether we will go to the new normal uh, soon or later. Uh, let's discuss, yeah. Uh, next slide, Bupinkan. First, I would like to uh, talk about the normal. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit bound with the uh, statistics. Yeah. Next slide, Ibu Pinkan. Next slide. Hello. Oh, I'm not sure whether. Hello. Ibu Pinkan. Next slide. Uh -huh. Next one is the coin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next slide first. Uh, can you just uh, um, manage this? The, the first one. Uh, just next slide or. Yeah. Next slide. Not the coin, before the coin, the, the oh, second slide. This one. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yeah, Pak. It's on, Pak. There's the one with the what? statistic. Normal, a statistic uh -huh. from set of distribution and characteristics. Yeah, well, in my screen, there is no, uh, there's still the, the uh, one, the, yeah. the first slide. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> What is normal? I, I uh, would like to use this concept. Normal or not normal is, a, uh, in my view, it's an economic, uh, a statistical concept um, where the distribution of characteristics uh, such a way and the majority will be in the middle and the, um, the tail um, showing extreme value. Um, so, this is the concept of what is the new normal? The new normal simply uh, depend on what is the progress. The new normal can go from uh, currently similar life like we do or can, can change or not change depend on uh, what we, we are having uh, in our um, life uh, very soon. We can assume that no normal can be achieved if we uh, find uh, vaccine or drugs very soon, then we will be able to um, have a normal life like uh, before COVID, just uh, last year with the uh, vaccination of BCG, uh, controlling uh, normal life with malaria and so on. That's nothing uh, really serious. Yeah, uh, depending on how how uh, fast we can find vaccine or drugs. Otherwise, um, if we depend on the herd immunity, it's certainly it will be. Uh, lot of cases, lot of victims, and so on. And if we are not paranoid, we can go uh, normal. But if we have uh, so paranoid with those information uh, flux, then we might be too rigid and too afraid of the um, situation uh, with the... Uh, sit the cases actually is not so uh, uh, worried, but our behavior can create um, problem. Next slide. 
the case of the COVID cases. Yeah. It's not yeah, uh, moving. It's, uh, it's a little bit lagging with the system, Pak. The second prof. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. The yes. Okay. Next slide. It is the point. Just showing you a concept of economy and health is uh, like a, a coin with two sides. Uh, we can see uh, with this COVID everywhere in the world, people suffering economically because of the COVID, because the health problem. The health also can be uh, victims of a poor economics. So this correlation between health and economic is showing uh, clearly in this uh, COVID situation. In my view, it's raising awareness of uh, what we invested in the healthcare sector before can, um, can show us how good we can uh, exit from this situation and what countries can, can do best for this because they have the uh, health system that capable and the social system, the government system that capable to manage this situation. So, next slide. The next slide is just showing, uh, as Prof. Amin already saw uh, in Paris province, but I saw it in the national level. Certainly, uh, there is a correlation uh, between. Uh, province level and national level. I'm afraid that at this time we are discussing about uh, normal, next slide, uh, normal, uh, new normal uh, in three or four, uh, four provinces, but I'm afraid also um, that the current MUDIC will, will change the situation where for example, Jakarta, uh, Aceh, or not uh, Kalimantan that's uh, showing declining, uh, but with the new movement, it can return. Yeah? The key success factor is discipline of the people and law enforcement. What we are observing is that both are weak in Indonesia. Uh, where people lack of discipline, unlike uh, people in the north, in the China, Korea, yeah, Taiwan, even Thailand, um, we are not that disciplined. So that's create problem. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, we just returning uh, the 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 uh, curve downstream, but might not be continuing downstream can increase the second wave. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, the Core South Koreans are uh, good to have example that they have a very quick response. Within two weeks, the curve reaching the peak and then going down quick and slow until now, even though yesterday there are new cases. So they, they can start new normal uh, clearly because since uh, early April, uh, they already in St. April, they already almost uh, flat cases. Yeah, we are still on the peak, so that's the situation. Too. How far we don't know yet. We don't know. I certainly cannot tell you when. Next slide. We can see also uh, in Germany. Uh, German is also quite quick. They already starting the new normal gradually. Uh, people uh, uh, going to work, although with limitation. Yeah? Uh, basically, what the new normal is that we live uh, for the economy, we consider the health. So that's it, the, the two coins. Uh, to what uh, extent the economic development depend on the sector, uh, but we really can do a simple way as long as the um, virus cannot be transferred through uh, close distance, through uh, um, unhealthy behavior, to unmask uh, nose, then actually it can be uh, prevented and we can do production in the economy, yeah, but depend on the cases. So that's uh, Germany. Let's see another cases. Next slide. We 
we see it in the US, you can see they can reach also peak and then continue very long uh, tail. It's the new normal being debated because people are afraid because the case is still very high um, until now. And therefore, uh, maybe new normal create risky in the public health sector, normal in economy, but uh, will cause some uh, more diseases, more cases or more deaths. Yeah? So that's the situation. So we can see depending on um, our discipline and law enforcement, uh, where we can or when we can achieve the new normal. Next slide. We can see also cases with the second wave after China, the Italy, they have also problem. Uh, people said Italy has a, a significant portion of elderly, but the highest elderly population is in Germany, in uh, Japan and Germany, uh, not in Italy. Italy is third or the, the fourth. If we look at the death rate um, in Germany and Japan, is very low. So that's another uh, problem that we are observing. Discipline of the people is the key for it. But we can see Italy already decreasing. Uh, so the normal life is expected, but still they just beginning. Yeah? We can see in our graphic, we are still in the peak. Uh, so maybe too early to talk. Let's talk also Singapore, next slide. Singapore is kind of a bumpy road, roller coaster cases like this, uh, but luckily it's going a uh, slower peak. Yeah? Um, but still, uh, Singapore cautiously started, Rob Tiki will talk maybe more about this one. So when are we going to achieve this uh, normal? Next slide. So the prediction for this normal will be based on the, the development of new cases. Uh, we can use uh, by province, but they will, as I said before, there will be a risk of uh, new cases uh, from uh, people moving from one province to another province. If we have a new drug and uh, vaccine, then it will be easier, but Current discussion assume that there is no drug, there is no vaccine until maybe 20, end of 2021. Uh, herd immunity don't expect because they're going to be a, a difficult and costly uh, people. And so the only solution is uh, I think we have to go with the, if we want to op start living normally as before the COVID, in economically, then we have to uh, ensure healthy behavior. Other than that, we can do um, the uh, survey for community survey to see how uh, big the population, um, our population has immune system. Next slide. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, just for short. Uh, the possible ship uh, or mega ship, probably, we don't know uh, if everybody ship through a new way of uh, life, a new normal, then we can have a big ship. But I think uh, for the hack sector, we are um, observing that uh, the traditionally weak health sector in Indonesia now become awake. Um, we understand now our health sector is very weak and then uh, effort to strengthen are coming. Yeah, uh, Health prevention on the rise. Um, we expect that there will be also awareness uh, to prevent other disease, uh, not neglecting because of the COVID and then we neglect uh, TB. Uh, we neglect uh, malaria. That will be a, a another risk. Yeah? So we don't want people safe from COVID but die from 
TB, from malaria, from uh, hypertension, from others. Yeah. Uh, many health professionals are now aware. Also, uh, we have a lot of opportunity to switch, but this is still on an awareness. Yeah. Economy, economy become more dependent on health sector. Um, we can see the discussion, although I'm uh, hesitant uh, to discuss the proposed, the current proposed uh, normal life because we still have to go uh, to ensure that our situation conducive enough. Next slide. We might have a simple mass vaccination if we can have a vaccine soon. Um, I think Prof. Amin can tell us how long it is possible to have mass production for vaccine. Might not be available within two years from now. Then we have uh, to prepare shifting health service delivery and payment methods. We might use telemedicine, we might transfer money, but we need to change our law because um, if that's the case, the current law, current medical practice will not allow um, telemedicine, teleservices and telepayment like uh, what we can do. Um, medical device business certainly becoming uh, open uh, because we are pushed to have something that individually can check at home. Uh, disease profile might be also changed. Yeah. But if we are continue being, becoming paranoid, then clinic and hospital will be underutilized. This currently, of many hospitals are suffering from lack of patients. The number of patients declined by 30 to 60 percent because people are afraid to go hospital, uh, afraid of uh, getting contacted with the COVID. We might still have the same behavior, although we call it new normal. People are afraid going that they will die at home because of the chronic disease. So that's the situation in health sector that can be observed with the uh, new uh, normal if we open too soon. Yeah. So other mutual effect is certainly a lot of uh, possibility. Yeah. If we have vaccine and drugs, certainly we might live like uh, 2019 and before, just having massive vaccination. Certainly telemedicine will be continue with or without um, COVID. Uh, without vaccine or drugs, we, we know that uh, currently we are doing this seminar, uh, very simple, it will be continue uh, for, for the future. Next slide. The economy, the main concern is in the short term is that uh, if protocol is fully implemented, slow economic recovery is possible. Yeah. Uh, if not, then we have a bigger problem. Yeah, the health sector uh, as a machine, economic machine, also not being uh, acknowledged at this time. Health sector is suffering from this COVID also, but many people think that health sector gain economically uh, from this COVID. So that's uh, unseen. Yeah, um, we might observe more cashless transaction in all aspects of our, our life, yeah, um, and so on and so on. I think I have uh, already run out of time. Then I think uh, for sure we can adapt with the new life. Don't worry, we've been tested uh, many, many times in our life with new environment, new race, we survive. Don't worry with that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Lutfi, sorry, I took more than you give the time. Thank you. Thank you so much, pa, uh, Prof. Azula. Uh, we learned some uh, new things from you, and uh, I think now we can continue to talk to you. The floor is yours, Prof.
Ya, terima kasih uh, Pak Lutfi, uh, teman-teman semua. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, to perhaps give you my perspective on what the new normal uh, looks like. Um, I am very grateful to, to Pak Amin and Pak Hasbula because uh, they have identified many of the factors that's part of the new normal. So I hope that um, what I have to add uh, is something that builds on what they have already uh, discussed. So mine is probably a much more sort of macro view of what I think the new normal uh, looks like. Um, let me begin by sort of highlighting the fact that, you know, human well-being and security has improved dramatically in the last 100 years. And, you know, if you look at 1919, 100 years ago compared to 2019, uh, there is definitely improvement because of globalization, improved public health, and of course, economic uh, development. But then this happened, okay? In the words of Joan Didion in her book, The Year of Magical Thinking, life changes fast, life changes in the instant. You sit down to dinner and life as you know it ends. So today I'm gonna to try to ask two questions. First, what changes can we expect in the way we live, work, learn and play? And how does, do these changes then result in the new normal of life after COVID-19? And the second question related to the first is what is needed to deal with the changes so we can live with this so-called new normal. So let me start with that first question. What are the changes? And this is my view of the changes which I think will characterize the new normal, mostly from a public health uh, perspective. Firstly, as already mentioned by, by Pa Abin, the virus is here to stay. Learn to live with it, to preserve public health, through good hygiene, safe distancing, mask, working from home, homeless, learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the first change that we have to accept. Secondly, and I think Pa uh, Amin also made this very, very uh, important uh, point that um, no one size fits all. Each country will define its own new normal in terms of its context, its capacities, its priorities, and its resources. Um, my point here is that because of that, okay, you can have an unevenness in the response. So if you do the right thing and implement the right public health measures, but your neighbor doesn't, you're going to be affected. Okay, I think that's the other change that I see happening in the new normal. Third, there is no free lunch. There is a lot of hard work, many difficulties ahead to protect public health. Sacrifices, trade-offs, restrictions are going to be necessary. So it means that policymakers will face many, many tough decisions moving forward. And I think something that probably is not uh, highlighted sufficiently uh, there is going to be an increase, I believe, in mental health and psychological problems post lockdowns and quarantines and restrictions. So I think um, this is a change that the healthcare system needs to be able to deal with. And I want to highlight also some of the risks related to these changes. A lot of this is, has the potential to increase disparities and inequalities the need, I think, to protect the vulnerable and the disadvantaged is going to be something we all have to uh, recognize and take care of. Secondly, I think there may be a risk of moving towards um, myopic sort of isolationist, almost selfish sort of me first policies rather than working together to deal with pandemics in the future. So that's an another risk, which we are al already saying at the broader geopolitical level, for example, with America first. 
And the third risk is my main worry as a scientist, and I'm sure both Pa Amin and Pa Hasbullah share this, is this continued denial of the value of science and evidence in decision and, and, and policy making. So just briefly, those are perhaps five changes that I see uh, as part of the new normal. So let me move on to the second question. If, if those are the changes, what do we need to deal with it so that we can live with the new normal? The main end point that I want to make is it is all about speed of reaction and anticipation in terms of how we will control and manage new epidemics or ongoing epidemic, as pa Hasbola has mentioned, the second wave. So what do we need to do? And I have a few ideas here. First of all, importantly, we need political will and commitment to implement rational public health policies. We need, together with political will, effective and inclusive good governance, which is evidence-based but flexible, which has unity in purpose at all levels, and it is free from political interference. Pahasbula mentioned the example of Singapore. Yes, there are some problems at the moment, as you know, with the foreign workers, but by and large, good governance, unity in purpose, political will, and freedom from political interference has characterized the Singapore uh, response. And this is once again, I'm grateful to, to both the previous speakers. We need socially aware and responsible populations, which places the health of the community before the health of self or the individual. And of course, once again, points that have been made before, at the center of all this is robust, resilient, sustainable, and responsive health systems, which can rapidly detect, react, anticipate, and fight fires. Okay, uh, there will be fires in terms of second waves, in terms of outbreaks in uh, certain vulnerable uh, pockets of the population. The health system has to be able to deal with that. But as Hasbula already highlighted, the system must be able to deal not only with pandemics, but other public health problems facing the population. So let me just highlight with some illustrations what is needed. Politicians, as I said, will need to make some tough choices. As Einstein said, what is right is not always popular, and it was, what is popular is not always right. So that's for our policymakers. Social discipline. I think Pa Hasbula made a good point of this. We won't, I won't uh, uh, um, uh, elaborate on it, but certainly we need much more social responsibility, social awareness, social discipline, if you like. We have to deal not just with COVID. We have to deal with other diseases. But Hasbola mentioned TB, malaria, dengue is another example. Importantly, we must make sure that vaccination is maintained at high levels. As we know, we have a problem with vaccine hesitancy, with a drop in vaccination coverage. We cannot afford to let that go down under the new normal. So some other issues in terms of what is needed. We have to have the capacity not to forget lessons learned and the willingness to enforce needed measures and laws. Once again, I think Pa Hasbula said that it's not just the laws, it's enforcement of the laws. Um, we have to be realistic. Science and evidence must still be the main drivers of policy, but acknowledging that other factors play a role. I worked for many years at the WHO with countries in health policy development, and I know that in the world of the policymaker, it is not 
just science and evidence. So we need to be realistic that policymakers can be under many other different pressures. No policymaker wants to make bad policy, but evidence and science is only one factor in their world. Uh, we need um, at the regional, at the global level, more solidarity and collective action and less of these politically driven blame games. You know, the US blames China, China blames the US and all this nonsense that is going on, that just has to stop. Let us deal and solve with the problem. And finally, what we also need, and once again, my two previous speakers have mentioned this, uh, multi-sectoral partnerships, okay, between all the key actors, government, importantly citizens, corporations, international organizations at all levels, global, national, local. Indonesia is a very good example. Okay, Singapore is easy. One country, one small island. Indonesia, one national government, higher provinces, uh, uh, districts, sub-districts, etc., etc. Much more difficult uh, challenge. So it is crucial then uh, these partnerships to prepare and rebuild our institutions. So in terms of the, my first bullet, I just want to illustrate the fact that we should not forget perhaps, okay, where COVID-19 originated from. We all know about the Wuhan wet market, but in Indonesia, we also have the potential for the sources of these viruses in the future to still be a risk, if you like, okay? So are we at the moment, it's quiet, but are we in the future under the new normal willing to actually stop the source right at the beginning? So just a couple of slides in uh, conclusion. I think this is the way I see the new normal. It's a triangle. People's health, economic survival, social harmony, and equilibrium. So it's about lives, it's about livelihoods, it's about freedom, but freedom with responsibility. I think Singapore Foreign Minister Vivian Balakrishnan summarized that very well. We need a tripod of quality healthcare good governance and social capital as foundations for effectively dealing with the pandemic now and in the future. And I mentioned at the beginning, the importance of anticipation. These partnerships to rebuild our institutions at all levels reminded me of what Warren Buffett said. Predicting rain, doesn't count. Building an ark does. Thank you. Terima kasih. Over back to you, Pak Lutfi. Thank you, Prof. Titi. Uh, I see, uh, I think, a lot of questions have been uh, put in our Q&A, and uh, we have uh, almost one hour time. So I would like to suggest if we can go to the question that we already raised and then later on if uh, we have some more time then we can discuss uh, if some, someone that wants to raise their hand. So I, uh, from the question that I have, I try to group in. So I uh, apologize if I may not be able to mention uh, specific names coming from, but uh, the first question will be to all of the three experts or the speakers. It's a common question from most of our uh, participants. Is the uh, from the perspective of uh, Prof. I mean presentation, and we learn from uh, Hasbula as well as uh, listening from uh, Prof. Tiki. Do we think that uh, we Indonesia is ready for the new normal in coming uh, weeks, months? And then uh, how how do you see this? Uh, uh, because uh, we. I mean, in the, in the field that you can see in the street, also people are still not disciplined to wearing the mask, and also some company are not uh, really putting the, pro uh, the health care protocol in place. And we have some you know, criticized from the uh, 
outside media, especially from Australia, that the Indonesian government is not uh, capable in handling this pandemic. Um, and then uh, in the same time, also we know that uh, two days ago, Prof. Uh, Jokowi visited the mall in Bekasi that uh, we are going to release some uh, PSBB, the last uh, restriction of the uh, social uh, distancing and so forth. So then, uh, what do you think this, uh, Prof. Amin, Prof. Asbula, and Prof. Titi? That's uh, basically some question from uh, many different participants. Oh, oh, thank you, Pak Lutfi. It's a very interesting question. Yes, uh, the same question has been uh, asked by many people repeatedly, actually, since a uh, couple of uh, days uh, in the last couple of uh, Of course, uh, we understand uh, why people are still asking whether Indonesia is ready or not to start the uh, I always uh, answer, as I mentioned before, that we cannot uh, say that the whole Indonesia is currently ready for the uh, new normal, but we have to uh, identify a specific situation in each uh, area. Even in one uh, same province, Probably uh, uh, not all cities are, are ready at the same time. Again, we have to be very careful to see, to, to watch what happened in, in that particular area. If the, uh, the, I mean, the curve are, is still showing increasing number of cases and we could see in daily activity that uh, people are not ready yet to implement uh, the PSBB. So uh, probably this is not a, a good time to start a new normal. So uh, in that case, uh, our duty is to first to uh, say educate the, the people um, about the first uh, the how how the virus behave and of course including how the virus is, is uh, transmitted and also uh, what they should do to protect themselves and what they should do to prevent themselves from uh, transmitting the virus if they have to other people, especially to the vulnerable uh, population. Uh, because the successful, uh, I mean, uh, the, the main factor for successful uh, implementation of PSBB is actually uh, public participation. Uh, we are not expecting that uh, the, the police or uh, the military will watch us uh, every day to uh, make sure that we are wearing the mask or we wash our hands. But if the people implement that, uh, the recommendation uh, voluntarily because they understand the situation, I think that uh, will be more uh, important as a factor of uh, successful implementation of PSPB. Thank you, Pa. Pa, do you have uh, any your perspective, Pa? Otherwise, uh, Prof. Titi? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Pak Lutfi. Um, I'm going to really defer to Pak Amin and Pak Has, pa who, who are in the country and uh, have a much uh, better uh, understanding and much better access uh, to, to, to the data uh, that is what is the current situation. But I think um, uh, from uh, much more 
a generic point of view from what I have seen uh, as um, the two speakers have already identified. I still see uh, uh, major uh, issues around um, around the sort of the education of, of the population uh, in terms of being more uh, socially uh, responsible. I also believe that uh, there could be a very important role for community leaders and faith-based uh, religious uh, leaders in terms of educating uh, the people rather than just sort of uh, top-down uh, government uh, directives. I think the role of the community in uh, especially in many of the provinces um, where there is limited internet access, for example, I think that could be another important uh, component. Um, obviously, with the structure uh, of Indonesia, with the central government, with many uh, provinces and sub-districts and local government, sort of uh, better coordination and sharing uh, of information, uh, that's going to be important uh, in, in the future. And finally, just to, to sort of say, um, um, I think perhaps drawing uh, more from the experience of other countries, uh, there is a huge amount of data out there now in terms of how you know, different countries have dealt with uh, different uh, situations. And, and I, I'm not sure whether we are doing enough to try and, and draw lessons from, from other countries. Um, not just in the ASEAN region, but in other parts of the world. Um, you know, in a way, because Indonesia, you would say, is a little bit behind, you can learn there from so many other experiences in terms of how you would sort of, as they say, bend the curve. So I, I will leave it uh, at that, Pak Lutfi. Sorry, Pak. Yeah, sorry, tadi uh, mati sedikit. Uh, yeah, I think um, I I cannot say we are ready or not ready. We have to be ready. Um, uh, the virus is there. Economics must be also uh, revived. Certainly, every choice has its own risk and benefit. Uh, we, from the health perspective, we might say we are not ready. But if we go that until we are ready, this government and many people don't have money also. They might not be uh, die because of the COVID, but they die because of the hunger. So the choice is so that when we say, okay, we start with this uh, province, fine. Uh, make sure that no uh, new people from other province coming into this province, for example, for Jakarta. That's the difficulties. People are not disciplined. People are trying to, uh, to sneak, uh, to uh, fool their official and so on. So that's the situation that we are facing in Indonesia. And therefore, I think uh, because of our government lack of money to support everything, to lengthen, to extend our PSBB, um, they will open it. But we have to be anticipate the risk. What are the risks that we are, have to avoid? The serious cases. Uh, and therefore, we might have to do educated the people, uh, protect high risk people, for example, the elderly, uh, those who have uh, serious disease, uh, chronic disease. So when they suffer from this COVID, they will not be very serious. The, we can reduce the complication. Uh, so that's the situation that I think we are facing. All right. Okay, so now we go to the question. Thank you, uh, anyway, to all the speakers. So now we go to the each question to the uh, different uh, um, speakers, but uh, now I'll start with the question to uh, Prof. Amin, uh, especially on the uh, what call it, the infectious. There's a question about uh, in the next probably a few days that we will open schools, and the question will be any data in, in, in our society that children can transmit the virus to each other as well. So, because 
because uh, I think they are more concerned on uh, if the school uh, start to open again. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pa Lucy. Uh, yeah, I remember in uh, in the beginning phase of this pandemic around January or February, uh, many people consider uh, that uh, only elderly uh, are uh, prone to the disease uh, based on the data shown by by our colleague in, in, Ch in China that showing that 80 or 60 or 80 percent of uh, fatality cases uh, were uh, above 60 years old. But in Indonesia, in fact, we could see that uh, uh, there are also uh, even babies and also younger uh, population get infected by uh, COVID-19. Of course, uh, uh, elderly people also, uh, they are, they show they are more uh, susceptible, but uh, younger age, we cannot uh, guarantee that younger age are uh, not susceptible to this, this uh, virus. So back to the <coughs> uh, school children. Uh, first of all, they are still uh, facing the same threat. They could be infected by the virus. Yeah. Of course, uh, we expect that they, they have better immunity, better health uh, condition, that uh, they could resist uh, to the infection. At least the symptom will not be very uh, severe. But they could become a source of infection. Yeah. They could become a carrier. So uh, when they, for example, hopefully not, for example, they got the, the virus from the street, from the school, from, from everybody, and then they bring the virus to their home and uh, they meet the family member, the parents, the grandparents, for example, who are more susceptible, then uh, could uh, cause a uh, big problem with the family. And of course, if, uh, yeah, if we refer to the publication, one person could, could uh, transmit the virus to around uh, three to four. So we could uh, imagine uh, the spread of the virus if someone is infected uh, and then uh, bring the virus into the house. We, we have to consider also that uh, in Indonesia, we understand that, that the, the pattern is in the family, usually is an extended family. So one big member of a family living in the same house. So the risk is there. But of course, we could, we could do something. If we would like to uh, reopen the school, then the school has to uh, implement very strict uh, measures to uh, stop or limit the transmission of the virus. Uh, that's not easy, but uh, we have to do that. Otherwise, we don't know. Uh, how long we have to keep the children home yeah, uh, with no school. Of course, uh, for uh, middle, middle class up, they could access the uh, internet and the school could uh, send the, the lecture, the uh, questions uh, through the internet or through, through media, uh, social media. But uh, for middle class down, uh, lower mid lower class, that will be difficult. Yeah, so uh, we have to, to educate also the school uh, managers, yeah, the principal, the teacher, and so on. 
that's uh, uh, not impossible, but uh, yeah, uh, need some more work. Oh, I mean, is there any way that the uh, Ministry of Education uh, kind of uh, providing or developing the protocols for all the schools and then uh, the worry from the parent can be at least uh, not really a big one. So and that's why they, and they can convince that they can send the, the children to the school. And just as you mentioned, that you cannot hold the, ch the children stay at home for longer time. No? So then I think the socialization of uh, having this protocol should be also in place. So do you, you see any uh, planning for the ministry? the Ministry of the Education to provide this kind of guidance. Yeah, currently I don't have the document yet, but uh, I heard that uh, they are uh, preparing for that direction. So when they have to reopen the school, then what uh, should be done by the, the school, the master and the teacher. Um, but I don't have the document yet. But certainly, uh, they are working with it. It means that we need to encourage the government to uh, provide this kind of uh, because you know from the economic perspective, the minister of economic and uh, all the others are already uh, ready for the new normal in the next coming month. But then, looks like the school are not really ready. But I learned from uh, your statement earlier. And the other question, uh, I think this is common question from. Uh, many participants as well. They are asking, is there necessary for all of uh, uh, population to do the rapid test or any kind of like PCR test? And the question will be, if yes, then uh, do you think that we need enough uh, healthcare infrastructure, the, the test kit and so forth? Probably Prof. Tiki could give us uh, or share share with us what uh, have been done in Singapore. Yes, I think um, that's that's a very good question, and it's obviously um, once again going back to what we've said before. Each country will have to determine its own strategy in terms of how much and how extensive testing they would like to do. Now. Obviously, that is constrained by availability of the test, by your capacity to pay for the test, who's going to pay for it. I think it is also uh, constrained by the problem that I'm seeing right now is that there are so many different tests around. And I do worry sometimes about you know, how reliable, how accurate some of those tests are. You have PCR, you have antibody test, you have antigen test, you have one that claim you can get a result in 15 minutes. So it is a, a, a very complicated uh, situation. But in the context of, of Singapore, and once again, you, you must understand Singapore is a special case, very, you know, small island, very, let's say, easy to manage. They have lots of resources very good uh, laboratory, uh, laboratory uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, their strategy obviously is to test the most vulnerable uh, segments of the population. And as you uh, well know, the last three weeks, the focus has been on testing the foreign workers, which is really going back to what Pahasbula said, they are the backbone of the Singapore economy. So there is an economic consideration there as well. They constitute about 20% of the Singapore population. So they understand that. So their focus was to, to really make sure that uh, testing is done in that particular uh, vulnerable part of the population. And of course, before that, their testing has been very much focused on uh, symptomatic uh, cases and obviously, context of those uh, symptomatic uh, cases. So once again, you know, in Indonesia, I cannot 
I cannot foresee testing everybody. It, it's just not possible, okay? I think the only other situation where that has happened is the city of Wuhan, which, you know, amazingly in a matter of 10 days managed to, to, to test, I don't know, 10 million people. I mean, that to me is really unbelievable and I cannot imagine that happening. And, you know, given the history that it was the epicenter, maybe there was some justification in doing that. But I think the short answer to the question is um, you need to make that decision based on your own context, on your own capacities and your own situation uh, in terms of the number of, of cases, the number of severe cases, etc, uh, etc. Et and of course, you know, you have this big issue of asymptomatic uh, carriers. Do you try to uh, extend testing to try and identify asymptomatic carriers? That's another level of difficulty as well. So um, that's a long answer to the short question. I think the question is uh, relevant because we've been criticized as well. But the number of testing in Indonesia is much, much lower than the other country uh, across the region. So the, uh, the answer as what you mentioned earlier probably still not been uh, uh, respond to what uh, could decide from the outside of Indonesia. The more we have the testing, the more we can control the, the situation. Obviously. Okay, uh, I think back, uh, still keep to uh, uh, Prof. Amin. The question is, um, you know, currently we see the number of uh, recovery patients is getting much, much uh, higher than previously. The percentage is also quite uh, emerging. But the question is how you see in the near future that the ability for us to reduce uh, the number of deaths and increase number of uh, recovery. Because the number, the increasing number of cases you can see from the from the data is uh, still a long way to, to be uh, threatened as what we expect. But now I think more important for us to understand how can we reduce the number of deaths and then ability to make the patient back to normal or recover while we are waiting for the vaccine anyway. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Lutfi. Uh, currently, uh, we, we are in the position, uh, as you mentioned uh, uh, just before, we are in the position of not waiting for availability of vaccine. But in the hospital, the clinicians are, are trying to find the best approach to uh, first, of course, to to uh, um, to stop the progression of the disease. If the patient enters the hospital in uh, say mild condition, so uh, we try. We are trying to not to let the patient become severe, yeah. Because uh, actually, if we consider the 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 pyramid, only small number of patient actually develop into a severe situation and also uh, become uh, uh, fatal. Yeah. Only small small percentage. Uh, Realizing that currently we don't have yet a uh, specific uh, antivirus for this coronavirus. So uh, the mm, clinicians are trying to use whatever available uh, medicine from uh, the antivirus, antibiotics, and combination with uh, many things. And we understand also that uh, the the theory behind the clinical sim is also changing uh, very much from the beginning. For example, at, uh, at the beginning, uh, we considered that the FATA case was, uh, were caused by uh, failure of the lung because of the infection. But uh, then uh, another uh, hypothesis developed that the cause of the disease is uh, damage of the uh, red blood cell function. The, uh, the red blood cell uh, fail to, uh, to bind oxygen 
So that's why the, the patient uh, can then fall into a very bad condition and uh, having uh, multi organ failure. So of course uh, the 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 approach should be should be modified accordingly. And uh, another uh, hypothesis also the clinical symptoms uh, deterioration of the patient was caused by um, agglutination or uh, some problem uh, with the blood again blood function. So uh, now we are, uh, the clinicians are trying to use approaches. And uh, just recently, uh, we started to implement the uh, uh, plasma convalescent to use the uh, convalescent plasma from recovered patient to help the uh, patient uh, eliminate the virus inside the body. Yeah. That's also one of the um, treatment, the new approach to uh, to stop the progression of the severity. Uh, hopefully, by that approach, we could uh, reduce the mortality and increase the uh, recovery rate of the patient. It requires uh, uh, coordinated uh, uh, work from the uh, Red Cross, from the clinician, from the laboratory to make sure that uh, the new approach is uh, quite safe, safe for the donor, safe for the product, product the plasma itself, and also safe for the patient. We hope that uh, the new approach uh, again, we'll save more patients. Thank you. Pa, pa Lutfi, yes. if, I, if I can just um, uh, add to what pa Amin had to say, uh, the question Please. that you posed was, how do we deal with increasing number of deaths amongst the severe cases? So I go back to what I said earlier about learning from the experience of, of other countries. And uh, that, because I've been living in Singapore, let me share uh, with you how Singapore is dealing with this. Now, obviously your primary priority is to take care of those uh, who have severe symptoms, who may end up in ICU, require um, uh, oxygen, uh, ventilator support, etc., cetera, et cetera. And then you have the next group of patients who are sort of moderately ill, maybe elderly with underlying conditions, but with, with a high risk of ending up in critical care or ICU. So the question here becomes, how do you make sure that your hospitals are not overwhelmed by patients that actually do require uh, close monitoring and intensive care? And the way Singapore has dealt with it is that, as we know, 80% of these cases are mild, especially if they're in the younger age group. So what Singapore has done is to move these moderate, um, these mildly ill people into what is called community care facilities. So the idea is that they are moved out of the hospitals to free the hospital beds and they are taken care of in community care facilities. And these community care facilities obviously do not have sort of ICU facilities, but they have sufficient medical care support, nurses, doctors, medicine supply, so that they can be taken care of when they are only mildly ill. And in this way, they have been able to free hospital beds for more serious cases. So that's just, uh, one option in terms of whether that's possible in the Indonesian situation, I'm not sure. I was just reading this morning that in Surabaya, the hospitals are being completely overwhelmed. So it, it could be a situation where you look at sort of community care. And the other point that actually just happened last night was that based on the scientific evidence, Singapore is now discharging these 
uh, mild cases earlier than before. Based on the evidence, they said that after seven days, okay, if they have no symptoms, they can be released. They can actually go back to work, okay, purely based on, on local evidence. So discharging a bit earlier, once again, freeing, freeing your capacity to take care of the, of the mildly ill and, you know, basically improving your capacity in your hospital. So just to share that. Yeah, exactly. uh, 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 can I add yeah. yes, from please. different perspective? Yeah. Please. So I, I uh, yes, we I follow the mortality rate of the cases. It's declining from the beginning to now, now reaching six point one percent to the total cases. That's the the reality in Indonesia of the reported cases. Yeah? Uh, although there are people uh, estimating there are many deaths that are undetected and recorded yeah but if we look at the the data just this is what we have our deaths per million people currently at five percent per million people in indonesia from COVID. singapore four per million yeah the us the us uh, 312 uh, death per million people. In Germany, 102 uh, per million people. So basically, we look at our number of deaths, it's relatively small, although it doesn't mean that our health system goes. As I said, our health system is very weak. Now we found out that we have a very weak health system. We, all of a sudden, we buy more ventilator, we buy um, more negative uh, pressure of ICU and so on. Uh, I think it's observed, I can observe that's declining mortality rate at this time. Hopefully, as uh, Tiki said, if we uh, continue separate the only serious cases as been doing in, in Surabaya at this time, that will uh, provide more focus to take care of the serious. If we look at the data, the the world data, only 2% of the cases are critically or serious, 98% mild. Hopefully, we don't have be uh, paranoid with this. Thank you. Amin? Yes. Uh, thank you, Tiki, uh, for raising this issue. Uh, actually, uh, Indonesia has uh, already done similar things. Uh, as you notice, uh, in Jakarta, for example, uh, the government uh, already opened or turned uh, uh, apartment used to be used by the athlete during the uh, Asian Games that accommodate uh, more than 2,000 and uh, they turned the apartment within one week to become an emergency hospital that uh, take, yeah, taking care of uh, those group of patients only very mild uh, clinical situation. So uh, the idea is the same. We reserve uh, the bed in the hospital for those with uh, mild to severe situation. Yes. Uh, uh, and also for those with uh, say, uh, comorbidity and uh, elderly and so on, and uh, needing the ventilator. So again, for those uh, with mild, mild uh, situation, mild clinical condition, they could uh, be treated in the, the so-called emergency hospital, not because uh, they have a facility for emergency cases, but the the hospital was, uh, I mean, uh, constructed or uh, prepared, uh, yeah, in an emergency situation like this. The capacity is uh, almost 3,000 beds so far. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Amin. But uh, we know that the capacity, capacity of the and capacity and capability of the healthcare facilities in the field different province a very disparity uh, and then we know that Surabaya also recently have some 
issue on the overwhelm of the patient. And in, in addition to that, what we learned just now from the from the uh, news that we have a we did random sampling in Surabaya for almost 11.5 uh, I mean 11,500 people, and 10,000 of them uh, uh, had the uh, antibody of coronavirus. And as a total is Java, we are talking about that. 4,300 uh, cases have been already uh, positive confirmed. So, do you see any uh, kind of issue of this in the near future? And then, how we deal with this as a as a province government or from the national national satuan uh, uh, Yes, if we uh, again look at uh, the epidemic curve. If the number of positive cases is very high, say uh, up to 100,000, for example, and uh, we have, uh, we are based on the data, say 60% or 70% of uh, those with positive results need hospital hospitalization, that means we would need around or more than 60,000 beds. So uh, probably in that case, the number of uh, people requiring uh, hospitalization already beyond the capacity of hospital. Probably uh, that is the situation in uh, uh, our brothers in, in, in Jawa Timur, in East Java. Suddenly, the the number of positive cases increasing, and of course, uh, followed by a number of those uh, requiring hospitalization uh, already beyond the capacity of hospital. So, overcrowding, of course, uh, really increase also the risk of uh, uh, transmission, yeah, from patient to patient, and also including from patient. Uh, hospital staff. Uh, that's that's uh, that is that's why uh, actually we are expecting uh, not very high peak, but rather a little bit flattened uh, curve. Although totally at by the end uh, the number total number of patient or uh, positive cases saved, but as long as the peak is not very high, so the uh, number of patients requiring uh, hospitalization not beyond the capacity of the hospital. That's uh, probably the, the situation happened in some area. All right. Thank you, Prof. I mean, question from Prof. Hasbullah. Uh, I think I can read one, two, three, four at least that we uh, yeah, question to Prof. Hasbula. Number one is the in terms of uh, uh, in the new normal, new normal situation. Is it similar to uh, the situation that we create the heart uh, naturally? And second question is uh, Can you in, say it again, Pak? Not clear. Prof. Hasbula slide uh, earlier. Hello? Yeah, can you uh, repeat that one? The first one? Okay. Sorry, the first question is is the new normal similar to create heart uh, immunity naturally? Oh, okay. And the second one is, uh, and, this, and the second question is, uh, in your slide, Prof, that uh, some country let the platinum curve after reach the peak. Yeah. It means that we have to patient that new normal life slow down naturally. And then uh, I think the third question is with the fact that the, uh, our people are not uh, really disciplined about the health behavior, including social distancing, even the, uh, the, the easiest one. But the, the other economic side, so we need to keep running. That's what uh, you mentioned earlier. This is like a double co double coins. No? Yeah. Any recommendation for the solution, bro? This is what the question. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. 
The new normal certainly not herd immunity. Herd immunity uh, or or more um, people will get um, immune system that can be achieved only by two ways. One, uh, artificially, meaning that we immunize people. If we can immunize, if it's vaccine available, immunize people up to 85% of the population, then the chance of uh, expanding the disease still uh, will be very small. Yeah? But that's not possible. At this time, we don't have it yet. We can let people have developed their immune system uh, by their own after the infection. But to reach that herd immunity that everybody will be immune, we will need also 80, 85% of the population get infected. That will take too much, too many cases. So a uh, new normal will not be there. Uh, new normal meaning that before we achieve that condition where everybody get immune, uh, both by a vaccine or naturally, we have to live in a normal economic productive, but still avoid uh, being infected by the virus. So that's the new normal mean. And therefore we have to, uh, apply, we have to adopt all the health protocol to avoid that one. But uh, we have to remember that no intervention absolutely protected us. We just minimize the cases. So that's the situation. The slowdown curve of ours, uh, we, we don't know yet, yeah, because we are still in the peak. Uh, as I saw you, the, the trend, the upward trend of our cases relatively slow. I don't know what the situation, uh, whether we have, uh, we have uh, some immune system. I read some of articles saying that in countries where uh, CBG vaccination, vaccination tuberculosis been high, the COVID cases relatively low, maybe because of that, we, I don't know, but this is the reality. The, the Prof. Amin may be and better know of this. The reality is that uh, the number of cases per million, the number of that per million in Malaysia, uh, relatively low, even much low, much lower than the number of cases uh, per million people in Singapore. Maybe Singapore now uh, more than one thousand per million. Yeah, I don't remember the data. Uh, in Russia, it's only uh, 60 or 70, yeah. uh, close to China. What are the reasons? We don't know, because people are not disciplined like in China or in South Korea, but yet the number of um, cases reported very low. It might be because the number of uh, tested also very, very low. Our test uh, only is about 1 million, 1,000 per million people. That's very low uh, compared to even compared to uh, Philippines. We are still half of those uh, tested. Maybe because of uh, lack of testing, we don't have enough cases. Um, this is the situation in Indonesia where we have relatively, sorry to say, poor infrastructure and have also um, low income. We cannot afford to have everything. Testing everybody is still not possible for us. We don't have enough money for that. Um, even testing for the tracing and testing only, we still have problem. So we have uh, some problem with the uh, data and the capacity of the system to detect the cases. The last question is the solution. Um, Speak frankly, I don't have solution uh, magic bullet, but um, I see the principle of public health still avoid having too many cases, especially in our system. As you mentioned, pa, pa Lutfi, we don't have adequate system in all provinces. So especially in the provinces where we have lack of the hospital, lack of the ICU, uh, prevent 
prioritize prevention uh, rather than let them uh, get infection. To be effectively prioritized if prevention is to uh, ensure people be disciplined, keep dist physical distance, wear masks every day, uh, maintain cleanliness, then we can, we can uh, reduce the risk of getting more cases uh, until we find somebody, sometime uh, vaccine or drugs. So that's the only solution, I think. Uh, we can work fine, but be aware that um, whatever we enter the situation with high risk contact, contacting, we have higher probability of getting contacted and uh, better prevent than um, carrying the patient. Thank you, Pa. Uh, pa, pa Lutfi, can I just yeah. add to this very interesting discussion on immunity? Uh, yeah. Just two quick points. The first point is I fully agree with Pa Hasbula that to rely on herd immunity is definitely not the way. And there is very good natural experiment and evidence two countries that have tried that the uk and sweden they absolutely then ended up with a situation and fatality rate that was very high so don't go the way of herd immunity the second point i want to make is that we focus too much on the virus how do we avoid the virus, safe distancing, using masks, how do we prevent infection, vaccines, how do we treat the infection, remdesivir, hydrochloroquine, whatever. My point here, because of my training as an immunologist, don't focus on the virus, focus on your own immune system. Make sure you maintain good health, good hygiene, good nutrition, okay? Don't smoke exercise make sure your own immune system is strong enough to resist the virus you know maybe that's one solution to add to what prof hasbula has mentioned don't be too obsessed thank with the you. virus thank the you prof third, that's right that's right thank you yeah and and the third point i want to make is about the vaccine if you ask me as an immunologist the vaccine at the moment is a moonshot Okay, Prof Amin has already mentioned, maybe not for another year or longer. Why? We simply do not know enough about the immune response to this virus. And the early Oxford vaccine trial has been quite disappointing, as you may know. And to pick up on what Hasbullah said, because I'm a T-cell immunologist, I was very keen to know that people uh, that countries where there is a high rate of BCG vaccination actually has a lower rate, rate of problems with COVID. I mean, there is, you know, uh, no evidence, obviously, but the BCG vaccine stimulates mainly T cell mediated immunity rather than antibodies. And what we've seen so far that the antibody prevalence seems to be very low tells me that it's not just about antibodies. There's still so much we don't know about the immune response to be able to say a vaccine is gonna be safe and the vaccine is going to be effective. So build up your own immune system. Thank you. You're right. I think we agree on that. Uh, I think just to have a last question to Prof. Fakula in regard to the, you mentioned earlier on the healthcare system will be changed as well as the the, uh, probably the government also now is also very focused on the, the budgeting for the healthcare system. How confident you are, Prof, in this uh, regard? In terms of the no, policy, uh, in terms of the budget allocation? Yeah. Uh, uh, frankly, I'm not so confident that the government uh, will be working adequately to improve our healthcare system. Uh, so far, I've been observing that the government, uh, since the beginning, focus on the economic rather than health system. So, um, with the situation, uh, the political situation 
so it's not good enough for Indonesia. We have too many parties. Each party have their own uh, uh, perception, their own interest. Uh, that will be difficult. But but I think uh, we don't expect that governments um, or political parties are moving adequately to improve our health system. We, our health professional, should do something to take this opportunity uh, to uh, invite their action to ensure that we will have more money for the healthcare. Um, we currently, uh, the government, the public financing for healthcare is the lowest among uh, middle in low middle income countries, even lower than um, uh, Vietnam, uh, lower than Philippines, uh, mm -hmm. lower than um, uh, sadly uh, East Timor. Uh, so, just raise awareness with a very low public investment for health. Certainly, we don't have enough or good enough healthcare system. So, this COVID as uh, opening uh, the situation and we have to use this opportunity to improve our health system. We cannot rely only for the government. Thank you, Prof. I think the I same would, I would really to, support what, what yeah, Pak Asbula said just now. You know, I think Winston, Winston Churchill once said, do not let the opportunity of a good crisis pass you by. This is a real opportunity to put, you know, stronger support for health systems right at the forefront of government priority. Mm. I think there are some questions that have uh, been raised, but uh, we have uh, also heard from you to, to answer this question. The only remaining question that we have from you is more in the, how you see this crisis lead to change in the policy with regard to migrant workers, quality, but not also, and also quality as well as how you see this uh, in the rural areas, especially in Indonesia, we have a huge number of uh, people are still in the rural area. How can we see this as a challenge for the government? And how likely you see this countryside become a new epicenter? That's uh, the main question that we have. Uh, the rest you've been answered uh, before. Yeah. yeah just just very brief. I'll go. Okay, terima kasih, Pak. Yeah, I think for the rural area, I don't uh, have uh, too much worry. If we look at the data all over the world, these cases are predominantly happening in the big cities with the crowding. The rural area where there is a lack of uh, less uh, crowdedness uh, will be um, less uh, likely, uh, will be exploded like in the big cities. Uh, but still, it doesn't mean we have to uh, ignore. Yeah, we have to still uh, be very careful. For the migrant workers, I think um, migrant workers need to be more selective, especially to be sent uh, overseas. Uh, so far, we send, uh, sorry to say, very low skill labor and low knowledge. We have to improve them. Uh, so we improve that. This is might not be related to the COVID, but um, it will Im have impact in the future. Thank you, Pak. Yeah, Prof. Yeah, yeah, just quickly to add to that, I think in the context of let's say international uh, migrant workers, the the example of Singapore once again is something that we can learn from. In the situation of Singapore, as I mentioned, uh, the migrant workers perform, I would say, 90% of tasks that the local workers are not willing to do. So they are absolutely critical to the economy of Singapore. Uh, so in that sense, I think in terms of government policies, they have done what I think is the right thing. They have acknowledged that uh, this is a vulnerable group. They have taken very good care of the health of these migrant uh, workers. Uh, they have provided them, you know, accommodation, even provided them uh, phone access, Wi-Fi. Uh, they have made sure that none of them lose their jobs by providing subsidies to their employers. They have um, approached this whole problem 
with humanity. Peri kemanusiaan in Indonesia. So I think you know it is very important that uh, uh, migrant workers, be it uh, internally or crossing borders, are treated with the respect and the humanity they deserve because they really are part of the economy of many, many countries. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Prof. Amin, Prof. Hasbula, uh, and Prof. Fiki. Uh, we have covered most of the questions. I know probably some participants are not uh, happy because there are some uh, questions is not missed, but no, we are trying our best to cover all uh, most of the question. Uh, we have uh, four minutes to go before we we, we go. So, is there any uh, maybe two or three sentences from each speaker as a closing statement before we wrap up and then we close the discussion? So, I mean. uh, thank you, Pak Lusby. So, just a short message. Uh, the, as I mentioned before, actually, the, the, the most important for successful uh, control of this, this uh, pandemic is active participation from the people from the community. So we hope that uh, uh, people will put, uh, have better understanding about the situation and voluntarily implement what uh, have been recommended by the government in terms of uh, PSBB and uh, all the related activities. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and for all, uh, yeah. we have to be ready that the virus, coronavirus will be endemic. We don't have to be uh, paranoid on this, but we have to be alert. We don't have to uh, prioritize very, very high for everything. We have to uh, remember we still have many other cases, uh, communicable disease that also have a high burden of disease, non-communicable disease, and those who have high risk, who are smokers, stop smoking now, who have diabetes and hypertension, control those diseases now so we'll be not complicating the virus the virus thank you yeah i think i guess my my final message goes back to what hasbula highlighted that um, there are so many different conditions different situations evolving in different parts of indonesia in the different uh, provinces and what I think we need now is unity in purpose, unity in coordination, in collectively solving this problem. And if you see the back of Pa Amin there, Bineka Tunggal Ika. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, all speakers <laughs> and also the, all the participants. Uh, we uh, almost close our discussion and uh, I will back to back to Lupinkan uh, for closing this our event. Thank you, Palutvi. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you to everyone who participated at, at, at this webinar. Special thank you to Palutvi, our moderator today and to our speakers who has given us such a enlightening and fruitful discussion and information. We hope that the participants also have enjoyed this webinar session. Uh, for your information, you. one, we will send a link to download the material and recording via email. And for our final say, we hope to see you again in our next webinar session. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe and healthy to everyone. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Prof. Amin, Prof. Hasbulan. Thank you, Pak Lutfi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Hasbulan. Thank you, Bubinkan. Thank you, Pak. Thank you. 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 Thank you.